Way back in 2008, NVIDIA would launch the first GPU to have over 1 billion transistors, codenamed GT200. It built on the great success of their previous G80 by packing way more power under the hood, and quickly became the most powerful consumer GPU in the world. As to be expected, this came into NVIDIA's new monster flagship, the GeForce GTX 280. The beast comes equipped with a fully unlocked GT200 core featuring 240 stream processors and is clocked at 602 MHz. For memory, it boasts 1 GB of GDDR3 clocked at 1107 MHz, which is running on a huge 512-bit bus, making for a blistering 142 GB per second of memory bandwidth. This actually makes the GTX 280 one of the very few NVIDIA cards to use a 512-bit bus, along with the refreshed GTX 285. Now with all this power comes great power consumption, and as such the GTX 280 has a TDP of 236 watts and needs an 8-pin and 6-pin pet connector for external power. Now this was quite a bit to stomach at the time considering it was just a single GPU card, as up to this point the only cards that would get close to the 200 watt mark were dual GPU solutions. Before we talk a little more about GT200, let's look at the story of Nvidia's Tesla architecture up to this point. Back in late 2006, Nvidia introduced their new unified shader architecture to the masses with the 8800 GTX. Now this revered flagship brought monster performance and a slew of new features to the table back then, quickly taking the GPU world by storm and making G80 a massive success for Nvidia overall. Around a year later in October of 2007, Nvidia would introduce the greatly cost cut 8800 GT. This new card didn't make too many advances features and performance wise but made use of a tweaked and optimized G80 dubbed G92, which saw great decreases to power consumption and price thanks to a processing from 90 nanometers to 65. The 8800 GT was arguably an even bigger success than the original G80 cards, with the excellent price greatly improving its accessibility and revitalizing the at the time very stale mid-range segment. By this point though, it had been a while since Nvidia launched the 8800 GTX, and was expected to follow up with another flagship soon. And that brings us to June of 2008 when we got what was one of the biggest and baddest GPUs for years to come. This GPU known as GT200 was unmistakably Nvidia's new top dog, and was introduced in this very graphics card, the GTX 280. Architecturally, GT200 was largely the same as its predecessor, but perhaps the most notable change here is the massive increase in raw execution resources. GT200 had nearly double the stream processor count over G80, and naturally this brought about a huge performance improvement over the 8800 GTX. Another less notable but still welcome change was the introduction of more granular power states, allowing for GPU power consumption as low as 25 watts at idle, which was very much needed. So, how did this new card stack up against its ATI competition? Well, at this time the fastest card ATI had available was the HD4870, and while it was a great performer, it was focused more on delivering excellent value rather than trying to be at the apex of performance. However, grab another one and now things start to get a little interesting, as two of these cards could perform very similarly to a single GTX 280. That's a battle for another day though. As far as single card solutions go, the 280 remained uncontested at the top spot. While it was a significantly worse value than the HD 4870, it was still the fastest single GPU card in the world at the time, giving it some pretty widespread adoption by the high-end and enthusiast market. It was pretty much the best option for those who wanted the fastest no-frills solution available. With some history out of the way, let's take a look at today's sample. This card was purchased online as a part of a lot of untested Nvidia cards, and to my surprise it ended up working just fine. Impressive considering these cards are pretty notorious for running hot and cooking themselves to death. I removed the original stickers as they were in terrible condition, but they showed this card as an OCX model by BFG Tech and is using the reference cooler and PCB. I must say I really like this reference design, it's probably one of my favorites by Nvidia so far. Its looks mean business with a simple and clean black design, and while the glossy plastic is a bit annoying to maintain, it still looks quite sexy. I would open up the card and show you the inside, but unfortunately this thing is held together with a bunch of plastic snaps that are really easy to break, and I ended up losing quite a few of them while changing the paste. I don't want to break any more, so I decided to leave it be for now. So that's enough on the card, it's time to get into some tests. Now I like to include overclocked results in my testing, so I did some tuning using MSI Afterburner and ended up with a core clock of 725MHz, a shader clock of 1450, and a memory clock of 1300. This represents a 20% increase on the core, a 12% increase on the shader, and a 17% increase on memory. Not too bad for this old monster. 
In order to hit these frequencies though, I need to increase the core voltage to 1250 millivolts or 62 millivolts over stock. Now this card's cooling had a lot of trouble coping with higher frequencies and voltage, so I used a fixed fan speed of 85%. It's pretty loud, but not as bad as most other blower fans. Today we'll be using the good old 3770K testbed, and all the detailed specs as well as the drivers used will be on screen. That being said, let's now dig into some testing. First came up is the ever popular GTA 5, and I use 1080p along with the normal settings throughout with no AA and 4xAF. Stock the Beast put down 52 frames per second on average, with 1% lows down to 36. When overclocked, we jumped up 15% to a nice 60 FPS, with 1% lows rising 11% to 40. Frame times remained fairly tight throughout my entire 2 minute capture of the built in benchmark, and it was nice to see some good overclock scaling as well. The GTX 280 held its own here despite its age, not a bad showing considering this is one of the later and more demanding DX10 games. Looking at another newer DX10 game, we have Tomb Raider, and I used the built-in benchmark with a high preset at 1080p and the card averaged 59 frames per second with 1% lows down to 42. When overclocked, averages rose 14% to 67, with 1% lows also rising 14% to 48. Frame times were excellent with only a couple of very minor swings during the run. Overall, it's a very nice result for this 15-year-old flagship. Next up is everyone's favorite system killer and the origin of an undying meme, Crisis. We used the built-in benchmark for testing at 1080p with the high preset, and the card returned 44 frames per second on average with 1% lows down to 33. Overclocked averages rose 16% to 51, with 1% lows rising 15% to 38. Frame times were good with only minor swings throughout the run, resulting in a nicely stable experience. Here our overclock scaling was slightly worse than GTA 5 but still decent, always nice to see. Far Cry 2 is up next, and I used the built-in benchmark with the ultra high preset and 4xAA at 1080p. The GTX 280 averaged 58 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 45. When overclocked, we jumped 16% to 67, with 1% lows also rising 16% to 52. As you can tell from the 0.1% lows, unfortunately our frame times were not great at all, with many spikes during the run nearing a 100 millisecond swing. These were fairly disruptive but seemed to improve a lot when switching to DX9 mode, not entirely sure what's up with that. Stalker Call of Pripyat is another great classic, and using the standalone benchmarking utility along with 1080p and the extreme preset, the 280 managed a whopping 81 FPS on average, with 1% lows down to 61. When overclocked, averages rose by a great 21% to 98, with 1% lows rising 11% to 68. I will say this game is quite the sight to pull at this resolution and settings, and combined with the decent frame times, it was another great showing for the GTX 280. And the last to hail from this suite is Shift 2 Unleashed. I used the high settings along with 16x AF at 1080p and the card managed 56 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 36. Overclocked, we jumped 16% to 65, with 1% lows rising 17% to 42. As to be expected for Shift 2, there was quite a bit of micro stutter, and in addition I noticed there were some issues here and there with hard stops. This behavior was repeatable every single run, definitely odd to see from this card. I've had frame time woes with this game on a wide range of hardware, but this car probably fared the worst so far due to those large spikes. Even so, it doesn't get in the way of gameplay too much, but ends up feeling quite jittery. To grab some power draw numbers, I loaded up Unigen Heaven and used a static scene to allow the card to stabilize at its maximum temperature, then took a measurement from the wall using a kilowatt meter. Stock, the entire system consumed 262 watts, and overclocked we saw a 13% jump to 296 watts. To reiterate, these numbers were taken directly from the wall and they do not factor in PSU efficiency. That being said, this card really pigs out on power, and in fact it's one of the thirstiest single GPU cards I've looked at thus far. Even then, it's nothing terrible and at some point in the future I'd like to get a GTX 285 and test them clock for clock to see how much the process shrink helps with power consumption.
At the end of the day, the GTX 280 really impressed me in these tests. I wasn't expecting games like GTA 5 and Tomb Raider to average around 60 FPS at 1080p with decent settings, but the card held its ground very well there. Despite its age, this thing is a force to be reckoned with and it's clear to see why it's one of the fastest single GPU DX10 cards ever made. While this thing didn't win any value awards unlike its ATI competition, it still did a great job of breaking the dry spell at the high end sector with some amazing performance. For a quick note on overclocking, it was great to see some decent scaling from this card, with around a 16% improvement to average frame rates across the board. I likely could have squeezed more out of it, but I think I'll obtain some better cooling for that, as this Dustbuster cooler really struggles with an overclock. Jokes aside, this is definitely not the last you'll be seeing from this card. In the future, I'll be pitting it against some Crossfire to HD 4870s, and it'll also be a contender in a large-scale GPU comparison I have in mind. With that though, that'll be the end of this episode. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.